Welcome to Live with the Author. I'm Amanda Goodwin, and I am an associate professor at Vanderbilt University. I am also a co-editor for Reading Research Quarterly. And we have with us today here one of our wonderful special issue authors. Welcome, Margaret Vaughn. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And today we're going to be discussing Margaret's um, manuscript, which you can find in our special issue on the science of reading. And it's entitled Aligning the Science of Reading with Adaptive Teaching. Um, and it's by Margaret Vaughn, Seth Parsons, and Dixie Massey. Welcome, Margaret. Wonderful. Thanks so much. So I'm Margaret. I'm Associate Professor of Literacy at the University of Idaho. Um, and uh, as Amanda shared, my colleagues, um, co-authors, Dr. Parsons and Dixie Massey, um, they were, we, you know, we began teacher adaptability studying um, in um, my doctoral work at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro under uh, Gerald Duffy. So that was some of the background on um, my work and kind of where we, you know, what brought us to this topic. Yeah, I was going to say, well, that was what I was wondering. So how did you end up at this topic and how did you end up interested in the science of reading? So adaptive teaching, like I shared, is something that we started in our, I started in my doctoral work with uh, under um, Dr. Um, Duffy. And, um, you know, we were looking at, you know, adaptive teaching over the last decade. And, you know, part of the problem that we think with what's going on in the field right now is that we're really not looking at teachers and their professionalism. And adaptive teaching is really a mode for us to really accept and look at teachers' professionalism and who they are as teachers and the decision-making that occurs daily and the reflectiveness that they engage in to support the individual students who are in front of them. Yeah, so tell us a little bit, what is adaptive teaching for those who might not know the term? So it's an instructional approach that looks at the specific instructional needs of the students in front of you as a teacher, right? So, um, you know, you're making, you're working with students and all of a sudden they um, incorporate a discussion point and you pick up on that. So it's unplanned in the moment and you make a complete switch to what it is that you're doing. So that would be an example of an instructional adaptation that you would do during an adaptive teaching moment. And it feels like teachers do this all the time, right? Like right. people readers might be scripted and all that kind of stuff, but the you change what you're doing depending on what your students need. Right, and it's it's just so intuitive to what we think about what good teachers and effective teachers do. And it's really a cornerstone of effective teaching, but so too often, all too often, teachers are really restricted in what it is that they can do, especially over the last decade. It continues on now, but teachers are really re you know regulated in terms of what they can and they can't teach. They have a script, they must follow it. And, you know, we've known teachers that have been written up for not doing the same thing at the same time as their colleagues, according to the particular script that they were given. So, um, you know, so how, does your, how does your article move the science of reading forward? Well, so um, that's a great question. And we, we really wrestled with it. And we really were, are so passionate about the work around adaptive teaching because we believe in teachers. We believe in the work that we do. And we believe that um, Teachers are autonomous decision makers. They can make decisions in the moment. They have knowledge of their students. And more importantly, too, that students come to us at, you know, when we're there in school with rich stories and languages and experiences. And it's our role as teachers to support those in the moment decisions to support those individual characteristics of students. Um, so the science of reading, we believe, really is um, the reading processes, you know, phonemic awareness, fluency. Um, and so when we think about that, it's the particular skills that students must have in order to read. So it's the reading context. So how does it intersect? Well, one of our conflicts is that we really feel as though in our, in our reading of the, of the science of reading that it's discrete skills disconnected from those individual characteristics that students have. And it really views teachers as sort of these de-skilled sort of technical technicians who must adhere scriptly to scripts in order to teach reading. And we just don't believe that that's really natural. Like you said, teachers make these instructional decisions and these actions every minute of the day. And so we really feel like it's our opportunity to highlight that and capitalize on those moments. Um, and through adaptive teaching, it, that can occur. So it sounds like you're kind of pushing the science of reading to think more broadly, to, and especially to think about teachers and the various expertise that they have to use to adapt to the various needs of their students. Exactly. That's well put. That's exactly it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, so based off of your article, what should teachers do tomorrow? Well, 
So teachers should continue with what they're doing. And, you know, we really want teachers to read the article and say, yes, we are autonomous decision makers. Finally, you know, we see our, our voice and our perspective. And we really feel as though the article really highlights that dimension of teachers that we, we feel like has kind of gotten lost in policy and in practice and a, such a direct focus on standards. And we're not saying that those aren't important, but we really need to bring back the basics in terms of what is important and teachers are important in the knowledge that they have and so are students and students bring with us. So um, I think that's the first point that we want to emphasize that I want to emphasize is um, and also to engage continually engage in that critical reflection and asking, you know, who who is in front of me, you know, what is there, what are the specific needs of the students in front of me and how can I support the students that I have in front of me and not some predetermined way that might be prescribed in a curricular program. So I hear you saying, don't be afraid to adapt, to right. innovate, you know? So right. even if you're stuck in that position where you are, you know, doing more of a scripted program, you know, capital, like acknowledge, capitalize on your expertise to adapt for the children that you are teaching in front of you. Yeah, exactly. Right. Don't be afraid. And, um, and, you know, and I think that that may be easy for us to say because we're not necessarily in the classroom. And so I think that that really leads for us to think about principals and policymakers. Okay. I mean, give teachers that stance, let them provide that perspective and that voice that's so needed in the work and also support them in their decision making. And um, adaptability is a characteristic of effective teachers. We know that, you know, we have many studies that support that and our own research of over 300 studies has examined that and have seen that. So um, support teachers in their efforts and believe in teachers because I think where we are right now with COVID, we're seeing that, that I think that's one of the big takeaways. I'm just in awe of teachers and their flexibility, their adaptability, how they can take knowledge here and decide in the moment to support students. And I think um, I think we're being reminded of the important and the importance of teachers, but also the flexibility and the knowledge that they possess and, and their creativity to make uh, adjustments when needed, as needed, to support the specific students online, face-to-face, -face, in these kind of different times that we're in right now. And it feels like that's the hardest thing. You know, I, I feel like I'm hearing you say knowledge and honor, but is there a way that we also have to help teachers learn? more about how to be ad adaptive and how to um, like what to try, how to be contingent on your trying to support students and how, what to take away to see if they can absolutely. Then do it alone. And yeah, absolutely. I'm wondering what you're thinking about in terms of supporting teachers to build this really tricky expertise. Yeah. So I think a couple ways, right? Professional development, right? And one of the, the things that I think we think in terms of the work with professional development is it can really happen with teachers alongside of teachers. We as researchers don't need to kind of go in and rescue teachers. They don't need that. What they need is people alongside of them working side by side with teachers and modifying and adjusting our professional development efforts to support what they're doing. And so I really feel as though the role of action research and participatory research methods to support the students who are and the teachers who are doing the work in the schools. So I think that's one thing is to recognize that as a viable mode and also for principals and policymakers to adopt that in terms of step ups for pay and, and so forth and sort of use it as a resource um, have teachers teaching other teachers, I think is one method. Um, also with our teacher education, I mean, the, we can be a lot more explicit in our programs in terms of what is adaptability? How do we look at it? What do we do? Taking a risk, I think is another thing, is cultivating that disposition in teachers and also in our pre-service teachers that were in the work that we do. And also being realistic about the conditions of teaching right now. And I don't know if, you know, I think part of that is having deeper conversations and putting and placing our work in the schools alongside of teachers, alongside of school, students and schools and principals. And I think really embedding our practice in higher ed and also, you know, doing our research within schools. Very cool. So what does this mean for parents? So as a parent myself, I think, you know, I, uh, one of the things I struggle with is, um, you know, like every parent, right? Teaching your child to read, right? It's it's a challenging trick. And I think one thing I will say is that as you, as parents know, there's no child is alike. And I think there's no silver bullet to teaching reading, right? It just, it's just, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, it just, it's not, it's not that easy. And I think, and the approach that um, I'm trying, you know, we're trying to, uh, uh, support in this is this idea that flexibility and adaptability and thinking about reading as um, a, a 
a complex process that involves many different things. Individual students may need this, other students may need this, and it's specific to the students in front of you. So don't be discouraged, but also be wary of, of um, you know, that silver bullet mentality and that approach because it just doesn't work that way. Um, and it feels like also what I'm hearing you say is to support teachers, support the teachers of your children um, and recognize that like they're likely going to be doing different things for your child. And part of that may also be advocating for your child or helping your teacher, your child's teacher know their needs. Perfect. Yeah, I think that that's really makes great sense, right? Like we want to make sure that we have conversations with teachers, talk about our strengths that our children have, bring that to the, the foreground of our teachers and invite teachers into our lives and the, and the kinds of literacy practices and the languages that we have at home. I think that that's another dimension that parents can also bring to the conversation as well. So how does this move the field forward in terms of research? What should researchers do next? Well, I think one thing that we can try to do is to work across paradigms. I think many times we have our camp here and we have our camp here and then we do our own things and also very isolated in different ways. But I think what I really appreciate about, appreciate about the, this, this issue and the forthcoming and the additional issues that are coming is this idea that, you know, we can move beyond these dichotomous notions of what is right and what is wrong. We can have, we can build a bridge together and I think, um, I think that's probably the one of the big takeaways in terms of what we can learn from each other is that, yes, I might not agree with the isolation and the decontextualized notion of reading and reading practices, but that doesn't mean that there's not value in that work. And we need to work together to bridge the ideas presented in both and to kind of build and go from forward from there. Yeah, it's almost like kind of that collaboration. Because I think a lot of what your work is suggesting is that, you know, these interventions or these processes that we're understanding as part of the science of reading then need to be understood as they're operationalized into the classroom, especially for teachers teaching different students and different teachers. Right. As well, so it seems like, you know, we're all working as part of this larger collaboration, this larger partnership. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, working to, to expand our methodologies, you know, what can we learn from different experimental methods and how can we, you know, how can we build bridges together in terms of our research and become a larger platform to inform policy and practice, you know, and I think that there's so much value in working together to kind of move our, I don't want to even say the debate, I think the conversation to kind of bind us a little bit more and to have a larger voice in policy and practice, which I honestly feel as though it's, it's we're not being heard. And I think this is a great opportunity for us to band together to, to build that bridge and to build that platform. Very cool. I love it. So as we're, you know, thinking about this conversation, what are some key takeaway messages that you want us to leave with? So, uh, you know, support teachers, you know, teachers um, are, are knowledgeable, they're autonomous decision makers, they have, they have knowledge and volumes of, re of, of knowledge, and they have so much resources that we need to capitalize and build on themselves. Um, so our students, students have a wealth of knowledge when they come to us, they have rich literacies, languages, experiences, stories, and that's our opportunity as teachers to build on those and to capitalize while we're teaching to support those. And I think for practice um, and for, for our research is like we shared before, is to work together, to bridge together, to kind of have a larger voice against some of the, the educational reforms that we're seeing now. I think that that's kind of our big directive and our big charge is to work together across these paradigms in these platforms to kind of have a larger and, and more powerful voice. Sounds super important. The other thing I'm taking away is just expect adaptive expertise, you know, build adaptive expertise, expect teachers to be doing these wonderful things of adjusting their instruction for their students. And when they're having a hard time doing that, support them yeah. in learning those skills. And, and I think too, ask questions, you know, if you're a parent too, and you're not sure why something is happening, ask. And I'm probably sure that a teacher has a great rationale as to why they're doing what they're doing with your child when it comes to reading. And so I think that conversation piece is so essential, you know, for parents, but also for principals, you know, if you're unsure of what it is your teacher is doing and why they're not particularly using this particular aspect of the program, ask. And I bet there's going to be a great rationale backed by research in terms of what it is that they're thinking. Um, so I think that ability to, to trust and kind of you know, support teachers is, is really, uh, is, is, can't be understated. And I think it's such an important piece. I mean, I think the science of reading, like you said, it doesn't often talk 
in a way that's supportive of teachers. And so what's a beautiful aspect of this manuscript is that it really drives that conversation towards thinking about the expertise that teachers bring related to all these different things that we know about the science of reading. Because one of the things we do know in the science of reading is that teachers matter. Yeah, and we know that teachers are have strong expertise and we as parents, we as colleagues, we all want to be working with wonderful teachers. So I think honoring that adaptive expertise and pushing the science of reading to honor it and explore it. Because um, personally, I'm really interested in things like how do you measure it? How do you support it? How do you build it? How do you, um, you know, just like you said, work beside teachers to continue to adapt de to, to develop it because I honestly think that teaching is the trickiest thing out there. And so supporting teachers and helping them develop this um, is so important. I totally agree. All right, well, thank you so much for being thank with us, you. Margaret. I really appreciate it. And again, I'm, I'm walking away with some big ideas to think and to explore. Um, and my notion of the science of reading has been expanded. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Amanda. Have a great day. You too, take care.